Welcome back to the channel. My name is Seamland and today we're doing another Q&A. I know it's been a very long time since the last time we did this Q&A, but we're back with this right now. And if you want to ask me a question in the future, then make sure you follow me on Instagram. I'm doing the Q&A polls in the Instagram stories there. Do it. First question is about any updates to the true diagnostics age speed test that I did a few months ago for my first test the score for the speed of aging was 0 0.62 which uh, is yeah like the one of the slowest in the world and it actually would rank me at the rejuvenation olympics in the top leaderboard now i need to wait six months from the first test to do the third test you need three tests to categorize yourself into the olympics and that's the rules and uh, yeah i need, still need to wait at least until mid october for me to do the third test now i did want to do the second test but i actually had covid in the meanwhile uh, short-term covid and i had an infection and the any kind of infection whether that be covid or whatever other type of sickness illness is going to mess up the results because your biological age has been seen to increase during the sickness and uh, infection so that's why i haven't done the second test yet that will be you know, uh, worthwhile to do for the Olympic leaderboard. Yeah, I need to wait a little bit more and I'm probably going to just do the second and the third test uh, around the same time in October or the late September, somewhere around there. I definitely need to wait at least until October uh, 13 or 14 to do the the third test, but the second test I'll do probably a bit uh, before that. This episode is brought to you by Alitura Naturals. Alitura brings you the best natural skincare products for radiating skin and anti-aging. Regular skincare products are full of ingredients and fillers that actually cause more harm than good. Alitura uses only active ingredients sourced and handcrafted in Hawaii. Their products contain zero fillers. The Alitura Night Cream received the 2021 Clean Cert Beauty Awards for Best Face Cream. Alitura also has skin moisturizers, clay mask, serums, and cleansers. Head over to alitura.com and use the code SIM, S-I-I-M, for a 20% discount. Next question is, how much glycine would you need per kilogram of human weight? <laughs> so, you know, I did make a recent video about the Glynac supplementation, glycine and NAC. So the combination of these supplements has been found to reverse hallmarks of human, human aging and improve many of the age-related outcomes like muscle strength, gait speed, cognitive function and body composition. So it is actually one of the most proven human sup or supplements in humans, in my opinion. Like there's many other supplements that don't have pretty much any human data or human clinical evidence, but the Glynac combination apparently has actually yeah, like multiple uh, human studies, at least like five or six of them that shows kind of the similar uh, results. Now, those studies generally use around 100 milligrams of glycine per kilogram per day. And for NAC, it's 98 milligrams per kilogram per day. So for me, I weigh 80 kilograms. Then uh, for me, I would need eight grams of glycine at least to get those benefits and 7.8 grams of NAC. Of course, you know, you can even dispute that because I'm 29 years old and we don't know whether or not the Glynac supplementation would have any benefits for people my age. It certainly has benefits for the elderly people because those individuals, the older you get, the lower your glutathione levels are going to be, which will then increase, you know, the oxidative stress and the inflammation and just overall burden on the system. Whereas if you're young, your glutathione levels and antioxidant defense levels are much higher. So we don't even know if it would, or there's no evidence to suggest that the Glynac would have any benefits for someone in their 20s or 30s. But you know, I, I do take it on some days, uh, especially if you know, you're know you about to catch a cold or something, then you can just take that uh, and to support the glutathione and antioxidant defense system. Now, the issue with that dose is that you would actually need significantly more glycine than that. You know, the 7.8 grams of NAC per day is quite a lot. Uh, I haven't taken that large dose ever personally, uh, but, um, you know, it would probably be warranted for the elderly people if they're trying to raise their glutathione levels because they see that 2.4 grams of glycine and NAC each doesn't raise glutathione in the elderly, but 4.8 and 7.2 grams does. So, for the elderly, you do need a larger dose of glycine and NAC to see the effect on glutathione levels. 
whereas 2.8 grams or 2.4 grams it doesn't appear to be enough to see that effect so if you are trying to raise the glutathione with glynac then you need a moderate to high dose so at least 4.8 to 7 even 8 grams of glynac and of uh, glycine and nac each um, per grams uh, when it comes to glycine then you actually need more because your body already requires 12 grams of glycine for the collagen turnover your body makes three grams every day itself but the three grams are needed for covering the base requirement so like a baseline requirement for glutathione synthesis creatine synthesis and heme synthesis three grams now the elderly people or in certain disease states where your glutathione levels are low like diabetes or metabolic syndrome then you would need even more than that like you would need significantly more glycine because you know three grams is for the you know baseline everyday requirement of glutathione but if you're older or if you have a disease state then your requirement for of glycine for the glutathione is probably yeah like eight grams in that scenario like for me in my weight for someone who is lighter weight they might be have a slightly lower demand but you know still like a higher amount of glycine and nac is required for the glutathione uh, requirement in a, in a disease state or if you're older then there's still the 12 gram requirement for the collagen turnover and uh, the collagen turnover obviously is important for the skin anti-aging benefits joint health tendons blood vessels cardiovascular health so uh you know <laughs> your body makes three grams you need at least three grams for the glutathione and creatine if you're older or if you have diabetes or metabolic syndrome then you need even more than that to cover the glutathione uh, production and then there's the 12 grams for the collagen turnover now we don't necessarily know if the collagen turnover requires 12 grams of glycine or even up to 36 grams of glycine because we don't know necessarily what's the glycine recycling rate so if the glycine recycling rate is 95 percent then yes you need 12 grams for collagen turnover but if it's 85 percent like cysteines then you would actually need it's, it's 85 percent like cysteine then you would need 36 grams of glycine so you know the demand for glycine can be quite large and i think most people aren't getting the optimal amount of glycine they're certainly not eating any foods that have significant amount of glycine like the biggest sources of dietary glycine are like pork skin pork rinds <laughs> uh, chicken skin fish skin chicken tendons ligaments and you know gelatin if you make the gelatin powder into the jello you eat that as a dessert then that's a really nice source of glycine around 28 grams of gelatin powder has only five grams of glycine still so you know you need quite a lot of glycine for optimal health and optimal like anti-aging benefits in my opinion so you could need up to 15 grams at least as a regular healthy person if you have a certain disease state then you might need even 20 25 grams of glycine for both the collagen turnover and the uh, glutathione synthesis so the, yeah i guess i hope that answers your question how much you need per kilogram you know if you're looking for the glutathione then that's 100 milligrams per kilogram of glycine and 98 milligrams per kilogram for nac but uh, even on top of that you still need additional glycine at least 12 grams for the collagen uh, turnover and you could get that from a variety of sources you could get it uh, from dietary glycine sources but it's pretty hard like even 28 grams so like one ounce of gelatin powder is five grams of glycine and if you eat like some other foods that have glycine like maybe some fish skin or chicken skin then you're getting maybe three to five grams from that as well and if you take like collagen peptides uh, so one serving of collagen peptides 30 grams or something like that uh, generally or 10 grams sorry t 10 grams of collagen peptides is three grams of glycine so if you're taking 30 grams of collagen peptides then this that's 10 grams of uh, glycine so yeah you know 30 percent of collagen is glycine and uh, most people still aren't meeting that especially if they're not taking any collagen peptides or if they're not eating any collagenous proteins so they would benefit from supplementing uh, some glycine as well next question how do you keep igf1 levels low so this is you know relevant in terms of longevity igf1 insulin like growth factor one it's uh, part of the insulin IGF-1 signaling and uh, it is regulating pretty much like growth pathways it regulates growth in the body IGF-1 increases mTOR activity so that's the growth switch in the body high IGF-1 levels are associated with increased cancer and increased all-cause mortality because of 
pretty much getting cancer and accelerated aging. But the issue is that uh, the IGF-1 level follows like a U-shaped curve. So low IGF-1 levels are also actually associated with increased mortality. Now the, let's say, mechanism by which that could be is that either frailty and sarcopenia. So if you have too low IGF-1 levels, then you might be at a higher risk of hip fractures or just other forms of frailty. So you, you know, you're able to, or you just fall, fall on the ground and you break a hip and you're not able to recover. Or that applies especially to the elderly people. Uh, or the other mechanism could also be that low IGF-1 levels. So you need IGF-1 actually to grow brain cells. So you need mTOR as well to grow brain cells. And too low IGF-1 levels might increase your risk of like neurodegeneration or some sort of other similar issues or like dementia or Alzheimer's later in your life. So the sweet spot is somewhere in the middle from the perspective of the reference range, then IG1 levels, the lowest risk is around 115 nanograms per milliliter up to like 300. And after 300, the mortality starts to increase, but below 100 is where also mortality is higher. My personal IG1 levels are actually like very low. <laughs> the last test, it's the lowest it's ever been is 78 uh, nanograms per milliliter, which puts me into the higher risk category. Now, personally, am I worried about this? Uh, no, I actually personally believe that yes, you know, the growth hormone and IGF-1 and insulin signaling pathway and the mTOR complex, they are pretty recognized to be related to aging and longevity. And many of these humans even who have de defects in growth hormone pathways, those people live longer. And I personally think that my low IGF-1 levels are safe even based on the studies, that's where the higher mortality risk is. And the reason I think it's safe because I have plenty of muscle. I, I mean, I, I'm above average, certainly in terms of muscle mass for my age and even like all compared to other populations. So I have a ton of muscle for my uh, height and my age. So I don't have any risk of sarcopenia or frailty. I lift weights. I have very high bone density. Now, in terms of the Alzheimer side, then I'm not really worried about that either because I'm not at a deficiency of growth. <laughs> I, I obviously have plenty of growth signaling happening in my, in my body, it's, which is reflected by my muscle mass. So I don't really worry about those things. And I think that in my context, where I have good body composition and high muscle mass, high strength, and obviously, you know, I use my brain every, every day as well in a, a lot. So I don't have any risk for of any, any, any risk for experiencing side effects from the low IGF of one levels. So that's why I think it actually is pro longevity. It actually slows down aging. Uh, that's that's pretty well known across all species and in humans as well. So how do you lower your IGF-1 levels? Well, obviously the most important thing is to make sure that you don't have obesity and you're not overweight. Being overweight generally is a sign that your body is overnourished and uh, you are expressing the mTOR signaling. And if you have high insulin levels, you're your body has like a ton of excess energy, then that's a huge signal for the IGF-1 pathway to get activated as well. So if you have IGF-1 levels above 300 and you're overweight, then just losing weight is the most important thing that you can do to lower the IGF-1 levels. Other things that can also help with that is maintaining good glycemia. So insulin stimulates IGF-1 signaling. So uh, making sure that you don't have hyperinsulinemia or hyperglycemia. So make sure that you improve your diet like, you know, how many carbs you should eat depends on people. I actually eat a lot of carbs as well. <laughs> so I eat plenty of carbs. I might eat like 200 grams of carbs a day, uh, which isn't low carb. It's not keto by any means, but my IGF-1 levels are still super low. And the reason why I'm able to do that is because I maintain a good weight. I exercise regularly. So I'm using the carbohydrates all the time. I'm never in like a surplus of carbohydrates and I'm never in a surplus of blood glucose levels in that sense. Like my, my body doesn't experience hyperinsulinemia or hyperglycemia. My insulin levels are low, below three, and my IG1 levels are low as well, which reflects that my body isn't experiencing energy excess, if that makes sense. My body fat percentage is low and I'm just using all the energy I have. I'm in a calorie deficit most of the time. So yeah, that's why the IG1 levels are low. My body isn't experiencing excess, you know, energy and excess growth in that sense all the calories i consume all the carbohydrates i consume are used you know like appropriate way and the last thing the most powerful thing in my opinion is actually intermittent fasting so eating less than three meals a day is certainly one of the most powerful ways to reduce ig1 signaling because 
like I said, I eat plenty of carbs. I actually eat a lot of protein as well. I don't eat like a ton of protein. I eat plenty of protein. I actually consume dairy as well, which is thought to stimulate IGF-1 signaling because of dairy is supposed to make you grow. And it's, it's, it makes, you know, babies grow. It makes baby animals grow. <laughs> so dairy is very insulinogenic and it has plenty of growth factors in it. So I eat dairy, I eat carbs, I eat protein, I eat meat. I don't eat like a ton of meat. But the point I'm trying to make is that I'm consuming all these foods that traditionally are associated with higher IGF-1 levels. And the reason I still have super low IGO-1 levels is because of doing intermittent fasting. <laughs> so that's the most powerful strategy for reducing the IGO-1 levels. And I believe also affecting the aging pathways. And uh, just, just because I eat twice a day, like I eat once a day, but I stimulate the growth pathways twice a day. So first in the uh, around uh, 11, 12 a.m. I'll consume like a protein shake that is going to stimulate IGF-1 and mTOR. But after that, I work out. And after the workout, I'm going to have my dinner. So I'm only stimulating these pathways twice a day, which is pretty low compared to the average person who might do that four to five times a day, even six times a day or something like that. So if you're a bodybuilder who eats six times a day, high protein, high carb, high dairy, from the perspective of cottage cheese or whey protein or something like that, then those individuals will have higher IGO-1 levels because they're stimulating this growth multiple times a day. But I, I eat the same foods pretty much. Of course, I'm not eating as many calories, but because I'm doing that only twice a day and the first signal is actually very weak, it just has 25 to 30 grams of protein in the protein shake, then because of that, my IGO-1 levels are low. And of course, combine that with the lower body fat percentage and calorie restriction. So that's the effective way to reduce IGO-1 levels. If you don't want to do a lot of intermittent fasting, like you want to still eat three meals a day, then yes, you would want to reduce the foods that stimulate IGF-1, like dairy or meat or carbohydrates. And if you're staying like lower carb and eating more plant-based, then that will also reduce your IGF-1 levels. So like a high carb, no animal meat uh, vegan, even if they eat three meals a day, their IGF-1 levels would be around 100 because they don't have, they don't have the methionine and leucine primarily in, that you get from animal protein and uh, that would also keep their IGF-1 levels low. But if you eat a lot of dairy and carbs and protein three to four times a day, then that's going to raise the IGF-1 levels, if that makes sense. Next question, with cooking meat, how do you make sure that you're not getting too many AGEs? So AGEs are these advanced glycation end products and uh, these, uh, let's say molecules uh, are associated with accelerated aging and they can cause damage to the collagen. AGEs are actually the number one thing that, that damages your collagen scaffolding and structure. So they're going to cause wrinkles essentially. And they are also associated with accelerated aging and diabetes and neurodegeneration and cardiovascular disease. So these AGEs aren't, yeah, they're not like good molecules. <laughs> Some people might say that, yes, you can eat charred food and it's fine. You know, I believe that, I mean, in moderation, it's fine. Your body can handle a certain amount of oxidative stress. Your body can handle a certain amount of AGEs and a certain amount of acrylamides, which is the same thing, but in the form that you get from uh, starchy carbohydrates. And uh, your body can handle even a certain amount of oxidized fats, oxidized canola oil, whatever. It's just a dose that becomes the kind of uh, detrimental thing after a certain tipping point after the tipping point after which your body's antioxidant defense system isn't able to counteract these molecules, then they become seriously harmful. So how do you reduce the AGEs? AGEs primarily form if you cook proteins, first and, primer, first and foremost, if you overcook uh, animal protein, and uh, especially if you combine it with certain carbohydrates. So glycation refers to the glucose component and uh, carbohydrates. Now there's also like advanced lipid end products. So if you overcook fatty meat, then you're going to form these advanced lipid end products, which are equally as bad <laughs> generally. So uh, the way you reduce that is, you know, you make sure that you don't char the meat. <laughs> so the, the dark spots on the meat that come from barbecue and grilling and high temperature cooking, those are the AGs. These are these heterocyclic amines, as they're called. These are the AG components that uh, are not good. <laughs> they're going to promote wrinkles and might contribute to some other age-related issues and disorder accelerate aging from the biological side. So making sure that you don't 
over fry the meat you don't overcook it and you don't char it completely like uh, the dark spots are pretty much the issue where the where, where the issue is at but there's also like ways to you know even if it does become higher temperature and even if it becomes somewhat charred you can use certain compounds to mitigate the ag formation so rosemary thyme different kinds of herbs spices they all have anti-glycative effects so they can reduce the formation of ages so whenever you are cooking steak or whatever food you're, you're just using high temperature even if you're doing stir fry with vegetables and rice i would always add certain herbs to there like rosemary is the most powerful one and the most known most common herb that has these anti-glycation effects and you should add herbs to pretty much all your meals like why not they have just such a wide variety of benefits like they're going to have this anti-age effects they're going to protect against the oxidation of lipids and fats as well they're going to suppress cd38 which is the inflammatory molecule that reduces your nad levels and they also these herbs also stimulate autophagy they help to lower blood sugar levels so i don't see a reason why you wouldn't want to add like a ton of herbs to your meals now the other components that can also help with that are you know the fat obviously that you use to cook with if you are cooking with very fragile fats that become very easily oxidized like canola oil or you know i mean olive oil is also fragile in the sense that it's uh, has a lower smoking point but because olive oil generally has a high amount of polyphenols then the polyphenols protect against the oxidation of the fat so it protects against the olive oil so if you have high polyphenol extra virgin olive oil then that's safe to cook with actually and it does uh, protect against the AGE formation so olive oil is generally a good fat to cook with I wouldn't still stir fry it <laughs> but uh, you know if you're just cooking any kind of food at a lower temperature then olive oil is uh, perfectly uh, fine you know obviously turmeric and other kinds of spices have similar effects as the herbs and lastly you can also use glycine glycine uh, lowers blood sugar actually protects against AGE formation and reduces the side effects of these AGEs. So that's that's the kind of uh, main, you know, order of operation. Don't overcook or don't definitely don't char the meat completely dark. You can add herbs and spices, rosemary, turmeric, cook it in olive oil or some other high polyphenol oil. And uh, you can also take glycine to counteract uh, that. Next question, your top 10 supplements. <laughs> so, uh, I have made, you know, obviously a lot of videos about my supplements. I also have my supplement list. So my own personal supplement stack that I take, you can check it out at seamnon.co forward slash supplement dash list is the website where you can get the PDF for my own personal supplements and when I take them in what amounts, etc. But my, what I would say is the top 10 supplements, you know, obviously number one, glycine, <laughs> number two, NAC, number three, creatine, number four, I like, uh, niacinamide or nicotinamide so uh, because that's regulates the salvage pathway of nad recycling i think that's vastly underrated nad booster is certainly cheaper than nmn as well number five would be tmg trimethylglycine uh, because it has pretty nice effects for exercise performance and it also is obviously important for methylation number six i would say melatonin like i'm a, actually still a huge fan of melatonin Melatonin as a hormone is obviously super important for anti-aging and longevity besides just sleep. As a supplement, I think melatonin is a safe sleep aid in certain situations. If you take it at a smaller dose, so I take usually like 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams of melatonin, not every night, but uh, pretty regularly. Then number seven, I would say I like glucosamine because it is anti-inflammatory. It has autophagy regulating effects. It has cardiovascular disease protective effects. And, uh, you know, there is at least a few studies. There are observational studies, but regardless, uh, glucosamine use being associated with reduced all cause mortality and reduced cardiovascular disease mortality. And uh, glucosamine is obviously important for the joints as well. So I have a very preventive approach to taking supplements. I want to take supplements that have like preventive effects mostly in my age when I don't have any you know age rated conditions or any chronic <laughs> diseases number eight is a supplement that i just personally anecdotally have seen to work very good which is hmb so it's a byproduct of leucine 
and the biggest effect of taking HMB, what I've noticed is that it helps to retain muscle mass when I'm doing a little bit of fasting. And it has a yeah, positive effect on my body composition when I'm taking it. So that it only works for me because I'm eating at a very small time frame. And I don't want to have, you know, I don't want to have uh, multiple meals per day. It just doesn't suit my lifestyle and doesn't suit my, you know, like just work routine. It kind of wouldn't be the most preferable way for me to eat to have multiple meals so that's why i'm taking hmb in the morning in a fast state to reduce the muscle catabolism that would occur if i'm doing like a longer fast if i were to eat breakfast then i wouldn't see any benefits of taking hmb and uh, when in other studies in other clinical trials they find the hmb doesn't really work if the protein intake is matched and the calorie intake is matched what they do find is that hmb works in the elderly people who are at a higher risk of sarcopenia hence why I see as well benefits when I'm taking it while fasting. <laughs> so obviously I'm not old, I don't have sarcopenia, but the thing is, yeah, like in a small eating window as with one meal a day or two meals a day, then I personally see a benefit of taking HMB. It might not work for anyone else who uh, is eating like breakfast or other multiple meals. Number nine supplement is collagen. So uh, I take collagen every day and uh, it's a good source of glycine. But the reason I'm taking collagen is also that you know, it actually just reflects what the clinical trials say, that the collagen peptides, the small amino acid chains in the collagen is what has these anti-aging benefits for the skin and reduces hallmarks of skin aging and promotes skin longevity. So uh, based on the evidence that the collagen peptides work, whereas we don't have, you know, any, any evidence that the gelatin powder would work, <laughs> for example, although it does contain uh, some collagenous amino acids and glycine as well. So I take the collagen peptides based on the evidence that we have that it's the collagen peptides, the small amino acid change that uh, have those uh, skin longevity benefits. And lastly, number 10 is hyaluronic acid. So this is another skin, let's say compound that also improves skin hydration and skin moisturization. There's actually some solid evidence in humans as well that it does have those benefits for the skin. So uh, I do take it uh, pretty much every day. Next question, how you started building up your dreams? <laughs> So I, I guess I haven't really um, uh, framed or uh, outlined what are my goals with this channel and my like personal brand. So obviously I'm interested in longevity, I'm interested in anti-aging and life extension. Like I do want to uh, support extending human lifespan as much as possible. I don't think we're going to become immortal, but I do believe that, you know, we can add a few extra years to the average life expectancy over the course of the next few decades and uh, you know who knows what's going to happen eventually but uh, you know what i'm trying to do with this brand and my, all my work is to eventually create like a system or or just a brand or whatever kind of methodology to support people to have better access to better health care and just better access to better medical care and better access to longevity care these kind of you know preventive health like uh, obviously governments do not the, not the best job <laughs> in a lot of ways but i just want to yeah like educate people to learn how to live better live healthier live longer with uh, all the different kinds of methods like traditional healthcare biohacking just traditional healthy living and uh, those kind of things so that's kind of my goal and uh, how did i start building towards that obviously i've been doing this channel for many years, like I've been actually doing YouTube videos since 2017, so six years, it's been very long. I've, uh, you know, I started at a very, at a very amateur level. I didn't know what I was doing. I just started making videos, started making content about different topics. My topics have evolved over the course of this time. Obviously, I personally have evolved over the over this time. I've learned new things. I've changed some of the things. Uh, but yeah, I've just started uh, creating. YouTube videos about biohacking generally and actually before that I started making blog posts but yeah in 2017 is where the YouTube channel started and uh, since then I've written multiple books about health and uh, by now I've written like eight books I'm in the process of writing my ninth book it's gonna be about longevity it's gonna come out probably the end of 2023 or early 2024 so yeah I mean it's a very long journey that i have ahead of me <laughs> and uh yeah that's that's what i'm generally doing and focused on right now next question best fast to lose fat and gain muscle at the same time 
So I think the best fasting window for losing fat and improving body composition is generally going to be like the 16 and 8 method. So you just fast 16 hours, eat generally two meals, maybe two meals and a snack or something like that. That's the easiest way. It's going to confine your eating window in a way that makes it easy to stick to a calorie deficit. But uh, yeah, obviously you want to make sure that you get enough protein and you also tr you also train and lift weights because otherwise if you just lose weight without lifting weights, then you might just lose muscle tissue in the process. So the key to positive body recomposition, so losing fat and gaining muscle or just maintaining muscle at a, at a maximum rate, then for that you need to lift weights, be in a calorie deficit and eat a higher protein intake. If you're not in a calorie deficit, you don't need that much protein actually. You're better off getting more carbohydrates based on my experience and the research as well that you know, your protein becomes increasingly more important the lower your calorie intake is to compensate for the calorie deficit in terms of uh, lean, mass, lean, lean, lean body mass retention. So you don't need a ton of protein if you're in a calorie surplus or if you're even at calorie maintenance. If you're in calorie deficit, then you might need a bit more protein. But the fasting window is there just to help you to stick to the calorie deficit and uh, yeah, make it easy to stick to the diet, if that makes sense. Next question, does the weight gain from creatine stop with continued use? So creatine, when you start taking it, the weight gain you might see primarily comes from water retention. And that water retention isn't, it's not this bloat, <laughs> as you would see from water retention from just gaining weight uh, or gaining fat. The creatine, what it does is that it makes your muscles hold on to more water. So it actually is positive weight gain, like your muscles soak up more water and glycogen and they look more fuller. And that might, that might increase the number on the scale as well. So I wouldn't really worry about seeing an increase in your weight if you start taking creatine because that weight gain is muscle uh, or the water inside the muscles it, it's uh, more soaked up uh, of water after a while obviously it's going to hit a plateau after a certain point it's not going to progressively increase the longer you take creatine it's just your body will saturate the creatine stores in the muscles and saturate the muscle or saturate the water inside the muscle as well so it does stop after a certain point like if you take five grams of creatine every day for five months, then it it's not going to increase from day one up until five months. It probably saturates after a few weeks of uh, use and then it kind of stops and then plateaus there. And then once you stop taking creatine, then you will generally lose some of the water inside the muscle as well. So, you know, it's not fat gain. It's not you know, weight gain in a traditional sense, it's just water being soaked up in the muscle. And the last question of the Q&A is when to take melatonin. So it depends why you're taking it. If you're taking it for sleep, then you want to take it like an hour or two before bed. I personally take it like one hour before bed. I take 0 0.1, 0 0.3 milligrams of melatonin for sleep purposes uh, before bed. And then you should already have higher amounts of melatonin once you fall asleep. And you all obviously want to support that with the blue blocking glasses and dimming down the lights in your bedroom. So you don't want to be, you know, taking melatonin, the supplement, and then you're still surrounded by super artificial and bright lights. It kind of defeats the purpose. So you want to take melatonin one hour before bed, dim down the lights, put on the blue blockers, and then go to sleep in uh, one hour after that. If you are taking melatonin for the immune system benefits and if you are suffering from some infection, then they actually use melatonin during the daytime as well. Like they take larger doses, like three to 10 milligrams even. So uh, I personally haven't done that. I don't think that it's uh, kind of needed. I would I would take just a higher dose of melatonin before bed if, uh, if it uh, were up to me because you don't really want to disrupt the natural melatonin cycle. Like your body makes melatonin only in the evening and when you're sleeping it doesn't produce any melatonin during daytime unless you're in a cave <laughs> like unless you're uh, not surrounded by any light at all then your body does start to produce melatonin even if it's daytime but um, you know i personally wouldn't mess with the circadian system because in the long term it can lead to some circadian disruption so even if you're sick you're trying to use melatonin for the immune system benefits and anti-inflammatory benefits then even then i would take the melatonin like one hour 
before bed and in that case you can take like a larger dose three to five uh, milligrams all right that's it for this q a make sure you follow me on instagram at seamlund if you want to get your question asked in the future but do you want to slow down aging and live longer if yes then i'm looking for more people who want to reverse their biological clock if you're interested then email me the word health to info at and i'll send you the details but other than that thanks for watching this video make sure you click a like subscribe notification bell as well my name is seem stay optimized stay empowered